Welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to be able to come together as we can in these virtual spaces. I wanna begin with a recognition that Oregon State University here in Corvallis is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River and Apanefu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. And today the living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. This is a recognition we hear fairly frequently now at our campus events. The hope is that we will take a moment to recognize ourselves in that history and the meaning of this. My name is Lydia Dittar and I coordinate Social Action Works. It's a professional development initiative in CLA, the College of Liberal Arts here at Oregon State. It's an effort to support our students to study what they love and find meaningful ways to advance public action in their personal and professional lives. And this evening, we welcome the Community Doula Program and some of its community partners for a conversation about their collaborations as well as their contributions to issues of reproductive justice and in particular, the ways in which the Community Doula Program transformed itself rather immediately 10 months ago uh, to respond to the urgent needs impacting birth and parenting presented by the global pandemic and the stresses that followed in our medical systems. We've planned a lot of different opportunities for conversation this evening and each of our panelists will share some component of their project area or an element of their collaboration. After they speak, we will have time for some questions and more informal conversation. You can post those questions in the Q&A and I will be madly trying to gather and compile those. Uh, and then we can share them once we've had a chance to hear from everybody on the panel. To begin, it is my total delight to introduce Dr. Melissa Cheney, Associate Professor of Clinical Medical Anthropology at Oregon State University and a licensed midwife. She is co-director of Uplift, the Research and Reproductive Equity Laboratory here at OSU, where she serves as the primary investigator on more than 20 maternal and infant health-related research projects, including this, the Community Doula Project. She is also author of an ethnography, uh, Born at Home, and co-editor of Birth in Eight Cultures. And she's published more than 60 peer-reviewed articles that examine the cultural beliefs and clinical outcomes associated with midwife, attended births at home and at birth centers throughout the US. And she is the editor-in-chief of the journal Birth Issues in Perinatal Care. In 2019, Dr. Cheney served on the National Ac Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Birth Settings in America study. And in 2020, she was named eminent professor by OSU's Honors College. She has received the Oregon State University's prestigious Scholarship Impact Award for her work. And she was a recently appointed chair of the OSU Institutional Review Board, otherwise known as the IRB. And she'll assume that post in the spring. All of these accomplishments are uh, amazing, but uh, she is also a stunning mother of a daughter born at home. And by some miracle of universe organization, which I think only Melissa Cheney could pull off, um, this daughter was born on International Day of the Midwife in 2009. So please welcome Melissa Cheney. Thank you so much, Liddy. Wow, I really appreciate that. So it's such an honor to be with you all here tonight. We wanna to thank you for inviting the Community Doula Program to come and tell you a little bit about what, um, what we're doing. And so I wanted to start first by just saying briefly that um, Mart Boberg, who's also here tonight as the co-director along with myself at the Uplift Lab, and this is a research and reproductive equity laboratory. And it is a space on campus uh, where we explore ways that community-led research and population data science and ethnography can come together in sort of innovative, innovative ways to allow us to imagine and implement more equitable reproductive futures. So in our lab, we try to elevate the ideas that we can somehow have rigorous research, but with that also bring along 
this idea that we can create spaces that promote growth and healing for everyone that's involved from the students that work in our lab and collaborators um, in the community to the clients that you're gonna hear about um, that are served by the program that we work in. So the structure for tonight is that I'm gonna have each of the uh, members of the round table just say their name and a little bit about themselves, who they are. I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of the program, the history and its project aims, and then each member of this really fabulous team is gonna tell you a little bit about what they work on. And at the end, we'll open it up for questions. So uh, we'll start with Alicia. Do you wanna just say quickly who you are and what you do for the program? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alicia Bublitz and I am the program administrator for the, the community doula program. I do a lot of the behind the scenes work involved in running a nonprofit. And Marit. Hi everyone, Marit Boberg. I am the um, evaluation lead for the community doula program. So together with Dr. Cheney, I coordinate the evaluations of the program. Um, I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at OSU. Thank you. And let's see, Helen. Hello, my name is Helen Wong and I'm an OSU honors student in my third year majoring in microbiology. Great, and Allie. Hi, I'm Allie. I am a um, traditional healthcare worker, I'm a doula with the community doula program. I'm also on the board of the um, community doula program. I am a field team lead with the trace COVID-19 um, study out of OSU. And also I am a master's student in applied anthropology um, here at OSU. Great, and Kristoff. Hello everyone, my name is Kristoff. I am a doula from the Community Doula Project. Um, I am also a PhD student at Oregon State University um, in medical and neurological anthropology. And Jeanette. Thank you, Missy. I am Jeanette McCulloch, and I provide communication support to both the Uplift Lab and also um, the Community Doula Project. Great. And McNai. McNai might be frozen, so we're going to come back to McNai on loose. Good to see you, Annalise. Same here. My We're just saying our name and how you're associated with the program. Okay, great. So my name is Annalise Torres and I am a doula. I'm also part of the board and um, on my day-to-day -day job, Monday through Friday, I work um, for the Oregon Health Authority as a regional outreach coordinator. And McNair, are you there? I am. Unfortunately, I think I have to keep my video off because my computer has decided to be finicky. Uh, my name is Mick and I out of no <laughs> My name is Mick and I out of Fine. Um, I am actually a graduate of the um, Master's of Anthropology program at Oregon State. Um, I work with the community doula program, I was trained as a doula. I'm also on the um, curriculum committee, which I'll be talking about this evening. And I uh, also work as a, a cultural organizer, consultant, and facilitator. Thank you so much, everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share for just a second and walk us through a little bit um, about the doula program. So this is just meant to be a bit of an overview. So the community doula program, and I wanna start um, actually before I switch slides here by um, having a big shout out to IHNCCO. So this is the Intercommunity Health Network coordinated care organization, and they are the primary funders for the community doula program. And, you know, I want to say too that they are beyond a funder. They, they have certainly provided us with um, the material means to, to carry out this program, but they've also been really incredible thinking partners with us and have collaborated to find ways to help make our program a success. And so we're, we've been really thrilled to work with them. We've received three grants from them um, over the last three years, and, and we're moving forward with an additional year of funding. And actually coming up in just the next couple of weeks, 
we are going to be um, doing our final report where we're going to go into great detail about the kinds of outcomes we've been able to to track in this program. And so um, we'll make sure that that people have access to that when we when we provide our final report. So let me just start by saying that I wanted to tell you a bit about what motivates us, why we uh, work together on this project. And we're all really inspired, I think, by this quote by Michael Liu. And it says, we can't all be created if we can't get an equitable start in life. And so we understand that inequity, you know, we often think about it beginning in the womb, but we know it really brings begins in our mother's wombs and our grandmother's wombs. And we feel that if we can come together as a team and find ways to make sure that every family gets the best possible start in the world, then um, that can make a, an important change towards living in a more equitable society. So the overall goal of our project is to improve maternal and infant health outcomes for pregnant individuals and their families through the provision of culturally matched doula services. And so in case any of you aren't quite sure what a doula is, um, a doula is a labor support professional who comes together uh, with a family to support them uh, in the prenatal period, at the birth, and then into the postpartum period. They're not clinical providers, so they're providing um, psychosocial, emotional, um, hands-on physical support, advocacy support um, that are not um, primary care providers who are responsible for the clinical outcome of the birth. So they essentially function as an advocate um, and help uh, clients and patients to serve, to, to navigate the systems that they move through when they're pregnant. And why, why do we care and why are we working on this? Uh, this is a slide that shows trends in pregnancy related mortality in the United States between 2005 and 2000, 2016. And what you'll see is that poor maternal health outcomes are inequitably distributed uh, by race, ethnicity. And you can see from looking at the light purple and the dark purple lines that black and indigenous people in the United States have maternal mortality rates that are two to three times higher, in some cases, even as high as four or five times higher than uh, white counterparts and that this inequity also extends to the babies. And this slide looks at the same thing for infant, neonatal, and post-neonatal mortality rates. So this tracks um, death of the infant when they're first born out to several days past, um, past the birth. And what we can see again here, very inequitable distribution of outcomes. And in this slide, it really highlights the importance of, of um, disaggregating some of these groups to look at where harm is occurring. We can see uh, that Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders also experience uh, higher than expected mortality rates. And all of this occurs against a particularly startling backdrop. I think many people are surprised to see this graph. And let me show you what it's saying. When we look at that blue line, what it shows is that between 1990 and 2013, across the world, we saw a decline in maternal mortality of about 45%, so a pretty significant drop in maternal mortality. And in high resource areas, there was a drop of about 38%. And in low income areas, low resource areas, that drop was even more significant by about 47%. But in the United States, maternal mortality rose by 136%. So we are moving in the wrong direction. And the burden of that death and suffering does not lie equitably across our society. It is disproportionately carried by people of color. Now we know from the literature that doulas can be a powerful way to impact and improve outcomes for mothers and for their infants, for pregnant people and their babies. And so the goal of our program was to provide doula services in our own community and then to track them over time to see if in our community and surrounding areas, we could see the same kinds of outcomes that other programs have demonstrated. So our goal was to recruit train and reimburse culturally and socially diverse doulas to serve pregnant people in three counties. So Lynn, Benton, and Lincoln County. We aim to recruit and train 30 doulas and we've trained over a hundred doulas and we have 50 more on a waiting list. So I can remember back in the early days of our program when our funder was like, well, I'm not sure you're really gonna find 30 people who want to be doulas and um, we did. Uh, and they are all incredibly extraordinary. Our second goal was to improve birth outcomes and reduce health inequities through one-on-one -on -one support and advocacy provided by birth doulas and to off, uh, offer doula support services to 
everyone who qualifies uh, for Medicaid in those three counties um, who were interested in having that care. As our program expanded over the last three years, we added some additional aims. We wanted to train bilingual Spanish, Mandarin, and Arabic speaking doulas, and we've been able to do that. 28% of our doulas speak more than one language. We're able to off offer services in 10 languages now, which is pretty extraordinary. We also wanted to train a subset of multilingual doulas as state qualified or certified healthcare interpreters. And we, we learned very early on from our doulas that often the role of the doula when they were bilingual got conflated with interpreters. And that oftentimes pregnant people don't wanna talk on the phone or use an iPad for translation when they are in labor. And so often our doulas were working as interpreters at the same time as doulas, but not being compensated for that skill set. Um, I will say that the pandemic interrupted that plan, and we've had two people who have been able to do that cross-training training, but our hope was to have six. And so um, when those trainings are available, again, eventually we'll, we'll take that aim up again. We also wanted to develop a training program for doulas that could be centered in community colleges so that people could have access to training to become a doula in a way that was more sustainable. It's actually very expensive to get trained as a doula. It can cost up to several thousand dollars to complete all the training. And this is a major reason why so few people are actually able to become doulas. And then COVID hit partway through um, our planning. And so we task shifted to focusing on what we saw as the greatest needs uh, in the communities that we're working in. And we arranged some multilingual pandemic parenting supports, um, online groups for folks. And as Ali's gonna tell you about in a little bit, um, many of our doulas task shifted to become community leads for, um, for testing and for contact tracing. Okay, and so the last thing I was gonna let you know is who we serve. We um, are able to serve anyone and we're specialized to serve anyone who qualifies for Medicaid who is categorized as a, as a priority population. So these are folks who are racially or ethnically diverse, speak limited to no English, our young parents, so that's defined as 21 or under, are medically high risk, so have medically complicated pregnancies, people who are experiencing um, homelessness or who are underhoused, and pregnant people with low or no social support. And this is the uh, category that's actually allowed us to serve anyone who qualifies for Medicaid because everyone can find someone in their life who's not supportive um, of their pregnancy. And quickly what our doulas do is that we have referrers all across these three counties who when they encounter um, people who are interested in having a doula, they reach out to our coordinator who finds out about the client and then connects them to a culturally, socially, and linguistically matched doula. So that's a doula that hopefully has um, some similar kind of life experience to the client. They have two prenatal visits with the client and then the doula's on call for two weeks before and after the anticipated due date. They go to the birth whenever the person wants them and stays for at least two hours afterward to make sure that breastfeeding is established and the family is safe and comfortable. And then provides two to four in-home visits to the, to the uh, mother and the baby. And during that time, screens for postpartum depression. And then all across that course of care, the doula is also working as a systems navigator to try to help clients get connected to the services that they're most in need of. So that's kind of our program um, in a nutshell. And I'm gonna stop sharing here so that we can start to hear from the members of our, our group here. So I was gonna start off by asking Christoph if you would say a little bit about your experience uh, training in our program. Sure. Um, if my audio goes weird, please let me know so I can shut off the video um, and just do audio. But I had, I think, I think I was in the first cohort of doulas in the program. Um, so there were a lot of spinning plates that were happening, but I think the way that it ended up folding was that we had so many different people from so many different um, spectrums of life. Um, you know, you have different spectrums of age, you have people from various cultures and linguistic backgrounds, you have people who identified as different genders. I myself was a male in the program. Um, and what I found remarkable was that, you know, at the same time I was going through, you know, my MPH at, at Oregon State University, I had had clinical training before, but this was the first time where 
um, the person that was doing the training that was educating us was more willing to be educated herself during this process. And I think that's what made the doula program the success that it is today is that she continues to be like that, which means that from her, there are, are births of different cohorts that have come and gone through different conversations within you know, a, a certain context that we're coming in. Um, and I think that just makes for a world of much more prepared doulas. That was my experience. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christoph. And at midnight, would you kind of follow up on that a little bit and say something about um, this initiative and sort of the model that we've been using to develop a particular training program for the community doula model and how uh, we've been working to move that into the community colleges? Yes. Um, so I actually have here um, initial letter. So I, I did, um, just to backtrack, I did the training with um, a woman named Deborah Catlin, who has been training doulas for I don't know, 20 years or yeah. Um, she's like this doula guru. And I was really fortunate to get to do um, the training program through her. She's donor certified and she is retiring and graciously as an elder decided to um, hand over all of her knowledge to create a doula training program for Oregon birth workers to be implemented through the community college system. And so we worked with her um, and I'm just gonna read here what she told us um, initially in a letter. Um, so I was a curriculum committee member and the content of the doula training portion is designed to meet the Oregon Health Authority curriculum standards for a state approved birth doula training. And it actually exceeds them, which I can definitely tell you after having read through most of this, that it is above and beyond. It's unbelievable. Um, and the entire training will offer all of the educational topics required for state certification. And it is designed to be used with a diverse group and can be modified to be used with culturally specific groups as well. And many of the learning activities she offered were um, as suggestions. And so uh, a group of us worked on this committee um, from diverse backgrounds. And we basically kind of went through and gave feedback on how we could create um, a curriculum that is inclusive and um, can be implemented in a way that will, um, while making sure people have the knowledge, also be able to be adapted to culturally specific groups. I personally, um, I'm Ethiopian American, first generation. And so um, why I felt that this is really important is because I know firsthand what women go through in having a birth in the US in a completely different environment, in a culture that looks at birth completely differently, dealing with language issues, and um, just the medical system here. And so I just think it's a wonderful opportunity not only to give folks um, training, but in a culturally specific way, but I also was a graduate of the community college system. And so I really believe in community colleges and I think this is absolutely the best place for this type of curriculum um, because it really does serve the public in a nonprofit way and um, can reach the most people. Is there anything I left out? I think so. That was pretty amazing, McKnight. I, maybe I, I think, and, and Annalise, you can weigh in on this, but I'm pretty sure that this curriculum is the first one in our state to really systematically include feedback from doulas who are actually on the ground providing services with the curriculum. Much of the rest of the curricula, especially the, the ones that have come from like national organizations, um, have not been developed with this kind of input. So I think it's pretty innovative. Do you know if that's true, Annalise? Yes, um, so I used to be a member of the Traditional Health Worker Commission, and yes, I would agree with you, um, especially the level of participation coming from doulas. It, it was just, it was just phenomenal. Um, having a lot of different um, doulas from different backgrounds uh, providing that feedback, um, and from 
you know, having experience already been trained and then be, I mean, we have the experience being on the field and then to be able to provide that feedback, Hey, we need this additional training or uh, maybe expand here a little bit more. And so that was wonderful. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's what's making this training, um, very, um, very complete to very whole and, uh, very specific to, um, the communities that we serve in these, um, local counties, um, Lincoln, um, Lynn and Benton. So, yes. That's great. You know, um, I think this kind of goes along with, with what you've already started talking about, but could you say a little bit more about that value, particularly of social, cultural, and linguistic matching and why that's important in our program? Oh gosh, that's key. I think to the su success of this program, um, I, myself, I am, well, I am a doula and my background is, um, indigenous. I'm, I'm an indigenous person from Oaxaca and um, having that background um, and that understanding of just the different practices from an indigenous community, now being able to be a doula for just different indigenous communities from Latin America definitely helps in, in being able to serve these clients a lot better in a very um, uh, understanding manner and uh, in coming from, um, from the background that I, that I come from has definitely helped in um, in making sure that clients are being served the best way possible. So um, my background is in public health. I've been working in public health for, I don't know, about 10 years. <laughs> and um, even though I, you know, I didn't major in public health in school, but I've been so, so long in the field that I am very familiar with um, public health. And so that in addition with the, um, expertise of just different um, indigenous cultures has been very important to serve uh, the the clients that I've been serving, which particularly, I think that over 90% of them have been um, um, from indigenous background from, from Guatemala. And um, just having someone, for them, having someone that understands the culture that is patient enough to try to ask more questions and to try to understand more where, where they're coming from is key in the uh, type of care that they're going to get, the level of respect that they're going to receive um, because of their cultural practices. So um, having, having someone um, helping them who respects them and who understands the culture is very important. I think just like for anybody else, you know, having someone that respects you and understands where you're coming from is very important, you know, when you're at the doctor's office. So it's the same way, um, having someone who understands like just certain practices that for some individuals, they may be weird or it may be um, totally not appropriate. Um, it's, it's, it makes a big deal. Thank you so much, Ana Luz. So oh, Helen, I, I was wondering, let me say that Helen um, is also the URSA fellow in our lab. So in, an, in the community doula program. So she has been working as our research fellow and is also an honors college student. So could you say a little bit about your involvement with the program and maybe some things about opportunities for students to get involved in research? Yes, of course. I, I did forget to mention before, but yes, I'm the URSA fellow for, with the community doula program and I've been interning for them for over a year now, I believe. Um, so it all started in the fall of my sophomore year and I'm a third year student now. Um, but so last year I had the pleasure of taking Missy's intro to medical anthropology class. And I was just fascinated about everything we learned in the class. And so as a sophomore, I was able to participate in the URSA Engage program, which is a program at OSU that helps first and second year students experience research or some type of creative activity under the guidance of an OSC mentor. And with Missy as my mentor, I was able to start interning with the CDP and I've been with them ever since. Um, and from the work I've done and from what I've seen from all the lovely people that are a part of the program, I think the CDP is a wonderful example of social action um, and I think just by looking at the people on this panel tonight, you can see that the CDP has brought members of our community together in a way where we can support each other and work together towards creating positive change and improving work outcomes in our area. And 
also, I think this program is amazing in so many ways, but something I think is so inspiring about it is that it also aims not just to help, but to also empower women in priority populations by helping them have the birth experience that they want. And so through interning with the CDP, I have been able to observe all this amazing work that the program does. And last February, I was actually able to attend a doula training workshop since I am interested in becoming a doula as well. But however, the spread of the coronavirus did put a lot of things on hold. So I have not been able to work as a doula yet. Um, and ever since the program has um, had to do a task shift, um, I feel like I've learned even more what it actually means to take social action. And I say this because even though the pandemic meant a lot of challenges had to be overcome, I think the program adapted really well. Um, for example, I believe it was mentioned previous, a bit before, but um, how the program was able to work with community members to create a multilingual um, pandemic parenting, parenting meetings. Um, and since I just love interning with the CDP and I love the work that they do, I was really passionate about having my honors thesis be birth or doula related. And after I expressed these feelings with Missy, she helped me brainstorm ideas about what kind of honors thesis I would be able to com complete in the midst of a pandemic. And I was really drawn towards the idea of creating a children's book about birth doulas. And I think I was really drawn to this idea because of what I had learned in Missy's class, as well as everything I learned from interning with the CDP. And um, to give a little more background on my um, thesis idea, um, in a hospital setting, a typical birth team would include an OBGYN or midwife, um, labor and delivery nurses, and possibly an anesthesiologist. Um, Generally, birth doulas are not included in a typical birth team, and they're not commonly employed, even though their services have a lot to offer. So I think the normalization of doulas may be beneficial since their services can improve birthing outcomes and, of course, make women feel more empowered. So for my honors thesis, I plan to create and publish a children's book targeted for third to fourth graders, explaining what doulas are and what kind of work they do. Thank you so much, Helen, that is wonderful. Okay, so you mentioned the coronavirus and how um, our project needed to respond to that as quickly as possible. And because of this amazing group of people that you're getting to know, we were actually able to go from a completely in-person visiting program to a telehealth program within a series of just a couple of days. So we were able to continue to provide prenatal and postpartum support, but there was a period of time for about six weeks where we were not able to engage in care at the time of the birth. And so our clients were having to go with just one support person from their family um, to, uh, to the birth. And so this was a really challenging time for our program. It was challenging for clients and also for doulas who were dependent on some of the income from providing doula care. So Allie, I wonder if you would say a little bit about um, just what happened with our team and how so many people task shifted over to Trace. Sure, yeah, I think everybody has, there's a lot of people. Um, I know Anna Luz on the call is one um, who was original to um, shifting over to the TRACE program from the beginning of the pilot study. Um, the, um, so for my experiences, I went to, I did a, a couple weekends in Corvallis with TRACE and Bend and Hermiston and Newport. Um, the most recent couple of um, weekends in Eugene and most recently Redmond, I did not participate in. Um, and then as far as doing births, I was not doing a lot of births um, because of, you know, at, um, the pandemic, we weren't allowed to go in the hospital. So um, as a single mom, my income was significantly impacted and um, having the opportunity to be hired on as ready to go, you know, with all of the qualifications needed and all of the um, education already in hand from being a traditional health worker. Um, it was seemed like a really good um, 
role for us to be in. And judging from our input to the program of Trace, they seem to be um, getting a lot from our community-based knowledge. Um, the thing that I would say that I brought from being a doula into the TRACE program is our uh, deep commitment to consent in the process of um, that while working with doula clients, it's a big priority to understand how they're coming to their decisions. So you want to know what um, information they're using. So you know, are they getting the most up-to-date uh, practice standards of care? Um, and so that was very similar to what we did in the community. We had to know what people were thinking they were agreeing to by being in the trace study and what information they knew. And so it was like this really quick, um, here's the program, here's what's going on, here's why you were selected to participate. Make sure that the person, um, the participant got had a full understanding. And if they said no, you still had to make sure that they knew what they were saying no to. And so those kinds of skills that I got from being a doula were really helpful um, going door to door. And additionally, a lot of people, because there was so much fear and unknown of what was going on, they wanted to talk and they wanted to process and they wanted to know everything you knew and what you were doing. And so a lot of times I just plopped down in the very, like super hot weather, um, in their, you know, socially distanced in their yard and just sat and was with them. And so that was another way that we were doulas in the field was we were just being um, with people in this challenging times. And, um, you know, part of the, you know, doula program and the trace program that has informed me as um, an anthropology major is um, I you know, the reverse of that, where I thought that kind of I could tell who was going to be living at the house by what their yard looked like, by what their car looked like, by all of these things that I was like putting people in boxes by analyzing what I thought were markers. Um, and then opening the, they're opening the door and it's like some people who I thought for sure would not have been interested were very interested and some people who I thought were, yes, were go away. And so, um, you know, my, I know that we all have cultures and communities that we are specifically aligned with because we come from those cultures. And so my specific community is people who distrust science at a very strong level. And so, um, coming into the community, I came up with people who felt who were this, like who felt this way. And so I was really able to say, you know, I'm coming to this work because um, a lot of people don't trust science and they don't trust numbers and they don't know what these studies mean. And I wanted to have my hands in collecting and being a part of this so that I could tell you this is legitimate or that, you know, don't. And so having that connection to the community member rather than as a representative of the school was something that was also from the doula program because at the end of the day you are you don't have an agenda to the person's decision you have an agenda to understand that they have all of the um you know information that they need to make a make a decision so and I know that you know the other doulas turned <laughs> <laughs> trays uh team leads will have a lot of the same experiences but and i know that you know based on different identities we have different experiences and so there's a lot of stories that could come out of this but i'm going to stop talking now so thank you thank you so much ali i i'd like to take a minute to talk with you alicia a little bit and see if you could say something about um the interns that have worked in our program so i i should say by way of introduction to this topic that we've been able to run this program on a pretty um, small budget, largely because this like incredible group of people that you see here, we've gotten so much um, work and um, just 
commitment from people who who are interning or trying to find creative ways to connect the work that they're doing at OSU, for example, for course credit with work that can really support our doula program. And if we had to pay um, the full amount of what all this labor has been worth, I don't know that we would have been able to get the program off the ground and collect the amount of data that we have to really demonstrate the um, impact of this project. So it's been a labor of love for, for a lot of people, and we could not have run this program without the input of um, our intern. So um, if you want to say a little bit about that, Alicia, I know you've played a really important role in helping to coordinate them. Sure. Um, so I got involved with the community doula program um, largely because I was involved with the board and I have a background in um, nonprofit management work. Uh, I do actually have a connection to OSU, but it's like a decade ago. So I forgot to even say that. Um, and so I came into this thinking of it sort of organizationally and all of the ways in which um, we want to provide direct services. And we, um, we do maintain a very small budget because we put all of our money into programming. Um, and what, but what that ends up having to look like. And so um, I actually was really excited to get to come talk to students today because I wanted to do the, um, uh, give some advice that I received when I was um, 16 and didn't follow. So today is one of those, um, do what I say, not what I did uh, moments. Uh, and I want to just encourage people to look at the different ways that they can be involved. So many people get involved in liberal arts um, degrees and so forth because they're, they're really excited about making a difference in the world and they want to look at um, getting involved in nonprofit work or uh, maybe government work the way that Ana Luz does and so forth. Um, all of this public sector work and we think we're going to learn all about all these inequities and everything else and then it comes down to it and programs need things like data entry programs need accountants programs need an understanding of what business looks like programs need um database software development and so forth so we've been really lucky um to work with a number of people many of whom were interns from osu um that can that have brought all of these diverse skills to our program so that we have people who are um, studying uh, in maybe the business department. Um, I also give presentations in the business department where I'm like, hey, the nonprofit world needs you people. Um, but have an understanding of what a balance sheet looks like or what um, you know nonprofit accounting looks like. Uh, and some people who have computer science backgrounds and can program us a fabulous, um, database wherein now we can put in a name and realize that this person um, had a birth with us in 2018 and now they're back for their second um, baby with our program and how exciting that is for us um, as a program. Uh, so we have worked with we have worked with interns who have um, helped with event planning, another thing that nonprofits do a lot. Um, uh, with our trainings and all of those. Uh, Helen has been absolutely instrumental on this curriculum project. So education majors and, and people who have an interest in education, um, how we have put that together and um, developed this curriculum. And I just wanna say, I just wanna remind everyone that all of these backgrounds are incredibly important. And if you really wanna stand out to someone who runs a nonprofit, I will tell you that like some mad Excel skills or being able to say like, I took accounting 101 at my community college. So I understand how QuickBooks works is going to get you hired. It's going to stand out for those entry jobs into this world. So it's, um, this is great. It's a great place to get that kind of experience. Um, you get, we, you know, we have a lot of fun uh, even on Zoom. Uh, working together. And I just uh, really want to encourage people to bring all the parts of their skills and their passions um, to programs like this, because this is, we are building this from scratch. And I know Missy gave um, a background of what our program is, but she didn't say how truly innovative this is. There are only two states in the country that do this. There are several others that are trying, but Oregon and Minnesota are the only states in the country that use Medicaid money to pay for this evidence-based maternal health care um, right now. And so we are really paving a way um, and we need all the skills that you bring to that.
Thank you, Alicia. And yes, and if anybody knows a bookkeeper, please contact me because we're in deep need as an aside. So speaking of programming amazing databases, we are going to go to Mart Boberg, who did just that for us. And Mart is actually going to tell a little bit about our process of tracking our outcomes, because this is also a research project. For our lab, we love when we can be contributing to scholarship at the same time we're engaging in direct services that can have an impact immediately on the lives of people, but also contribute um, to building a knowledge base. And so Mart's going to say a little bit about that. And I'll screen share again so you can see a few of the um, the graphics that describe some of the outcomes for our program. Okay, so thanks, Missy. We, mm -hmm. um, again, Missy and I started this as part of a team, and we were very clear from the beginning, as she said, that we wanted not only to improve maternal child health in our Tri-County area, but also to evaluate the program, not just because, you know, we're academics, and so we need publications in order to keep our jobs, and we also have students who need publications in order to graduate, but also because the chances of this program being able to be scaled up like across the whole state, we'd need to go to the legislature with numbers, you know? And um, so we have uh, planned both quantitative and qualitative evaluations from the beginning. And so um, based on these slides here, I'm gonna start uh, with some of the quantitative evaluations. And so we ask the doulas to collect a little bit of information from the moms and about their births and then we you know, analyze the data and these are preliminary numbers. They're also not published yet. So please don't uh, tweet them or share them or take pictures of the slides or anything like that. So as Missy said earlier, we have recruited over hundred doulas. Our doulas constitute fully one third of the registered traditional health workers in the state of Oregon, which is just amazing. And this slide is a little bit out of date. We now have doulas who speak 10 languages, Arabic, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, English. I don't remember the other five, but there's lots of them. Um, and families that have a community doula are twice as likely to reach their infant feeding goals. Basically, pretty much everybody who has a doula initiates breastfeeding which is just fantastic. Um, the normal rate in Oregon for women who initiate breastfeeding is 61% and we're up over 95%. So that's just amazing. And um, again, this slide's slightly out of date. Since this was made, we've had one woman who delivered preterm, meaning before 37 completed weeks of gestation, your due date is at 40 weeks. And so before 37 weeks, you're called preterm. And preterm births are associated with substantial morbidity and mortality, mostly for the infants. Um, and we've had over 200 births. And at the kind of expected rate of preterm of eight or 9%, that would be like 15 to 18 preterm births. And we've had one so far. So that's just amazing. And we've cut, our doulas have cut the cesarean rate from 30% down to 15%. Um, and both of those things not only improve the health of uh, women and infants, but also substantially reduce costs. And we don't always, when we're doing kind of reproductive justice and social action works kinds of things, we don't always like to talk about money, but that's how you get like the legislature and the insurance companies on board is showing that they're going to save money by paying for doulas. You know, they can pay for a doula. And even if they're paying that doula a thousand dollars, which for the record is way more than the doulas are currently getting reimbursed. We're working on that. But even if you pay them like totally a reasonable wage that, you know, somebody could make a living on, they're going to save so much money by preventing these cesareans and preterms that it's gonna to totally uh, come out in the wash. And I am working with uh, an MPH EPI student right now to analyze some cost data from this, but I don't have numbers for you yet, unfortunately, but it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good, I can feel it. We epidemiologists love to like feel things and not you know, have data. <laughs> and then, um, as I said, we've also done some qualitative evaluations. So we've interviewed uh, clients, so childbearing um, people. We've interviewed a bunch of doulas. And we've interviewed nurses and midwives and obstetricians that work at the hospitals that these births are taking place in. And across the board, people love this. They think it's great. The clients love it. The doulas love it. And doulas are not a normal part of maternity care in the United States. But in the first year and a half of our program, I guess two years of our program, pre-COVID, 
we got the local hospitals so used to our doulas and how good our doulas were and how great it was to have our doulas there that during those two months when they weren't allowed in there because of COVID, so this was like April, May, 2020, as soon as they were allowed back in, we got so many phone calls about, oh, thank goodness you guys are back. We're so glad to have you back. We love having you back. Please, please send everybody. Um, so it, it's really good. And um, any of you who all who are students and uh, wanting to do whether it's an honors college thesis or a master's thesis or whatever, boy, do we have data. So get in touch with me or Missy, depending on what field you're in, and we can hook you up. Absolutely. Many theses and um, projects have actually already come out of this. And there are several, I think there's six honors college students right now who are working on some aspect of this project. So it's a, a wonderful opportunity to get involved with research. So Okay, so now we're going to have um, the last uh, member of our roundtable is Jeanette McCulloch, and I'm going to say um, just briefly that Jeanette has really transformed the way we in the lab and at the CDP think about our jobs as researchers, and I can remember a conversation where Jeanette helped me to realize that when we publish an article, we often think, okay, we're done and we're gonna go do another project now. And Jeanette got me to understand that the publication of the article is actually just the start, right? If you want your research to have an impact in the world and actually be taken up in a way that is meaningful, publishing is just the very first step. And so um, we have started to collaborate with Jeanette over the last few years. And Jeanette's gonna say a little bit about the importance of knowledge translation and communications in this work. Oh, thank you, Missy. So as Missy shared, my background is in public interest, public relations or communications. And so what that really means is, at least in my own training, is how do we use communications as an organizing tool? And this really harkens back to what Alicia said, right? Which is, there are so many ways that we can influence this work and so many different really, really critical tools that that all need to be brought to bear on some of these very complex issues that um, I know all of you are working to address. And one of the things that I love about working with Uplift and working about CDP is both that you're, of course, doing this sort of work in which um, it makes good sense to translate the knowledge, right? And so there is research that we then, as we, when the research comes out, what we do is we look at it and we say, what are the, what are the pieces of knowledge here that we want uh, consumers to be able to understand? And we can put together, for example, social media graphics that help tell that story. Or what are the ways that this research could help influence public policy? What is the fact sheet that we can put into the hands of the on the ground activists so that they can go to their local state house and share the key facts of the research in a way that's digestible by legislators that are constantly inundated with information. Um, but the other thing that I love about working with the CDP is that it's really important that the values of any given organization are embedded in every piece and step of what they do, right? It's not just the outward facing work, right? It's the internal work, it's how you do the work, it's how it gets done. And it's also really embedded in the communications work of the CDP. Um, of course, and no matter what methodology we're talking about here, effective communications is always storytelling of some variety, right? Um, but we also have to be really mindful of the stories that we tell, right? There's some real grooves that exist in kind of the stories that we tell, especially when they're about people who are not from dominant cultures where you, there can, the groove can be saviorism, right? And so, and that is not the CDP model at all. And those same values are embedded in the ways in which CDP communicates. And if it is all right with um, uh, you, Liddy, can I share a quick video? Um, let me grab the screen here. I'm a community doula. Soy una doula comunitaria. Soy la community doula. Yo soy una doula en mi comunidad. I am a community doula. Soy una doula en la comunidad. 
أنا ضمن مجموعة دولة التي تساعد المرأة الحامل. Hi, I'm a community doula. Kamusta po? Ako ang isang doula sa pamayanan namin. Washi, need a doula. Sorry, Corvallis. أنا دولا من أجل الذين يتكلمون العربية. ما أبني كمجلية بيت دولا هجيا. أنا حجازيت ولادت إيه. I'm a community doula. So that was just one example. Of course, there part of what we're doing is telling the amazing story of all the different the different qualities that the doulas bring to this program right and it hopefully tells the story of the doulas in just a little tiny bit but it tells a little bit of the story of the doulas and we're really looking forward to other ways of telling the stories of the entire cdp program and of the families that it served as well Thank you so much, Jeanette. So we're about to move into the question and answer period where we have some time uh, with you where we can um, talk and answer your questions. And so I, I just was gonna close by saying one more thing about the way we work. You know, I, we recognize in the community doula program and in our lab that when we move in academic spaces um, that often our language is deeply steeped in critique. And one of the ways that we perform how brilliant we are is by tearing things down and critiquing them. And certainly there are places where critique is important, but we, sometimes we spend less time thinking about how to build something in its place. And, you know, I'm struck by the work of abolitionists right now that are reminding us that abolition isn't about tearing down, it's about rebuilding. And so I think what we share in common is trying to build relationships and work together <clears throat> in a way where we try to uh, forge a path forward that we, that we don't, fully understand or know exactly how to do, but we're committed to trying to build that, that new thing together. So we really thank you for taking the time to hear about our project. Thanks, Missy. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come in and maybe we can start, um, start by picking up on the storytelling um, and thinking about the storytelling as Jeanette spoke about it, but also McKnight um, with the curriculum, kind of connecting it to this uh, movement between storytelling and these academic spaces. And um, can you offer any thoughts about that and how that's worked and how you've experienced it just in the challenge of taking something back into an academic space? Or, or anyone, maybe multiple, several of you kind of touched on that. So maybe there are ways that, um, multiple of you could answer. So I was hoping Mick and I would jump in because she and I had a lovely conversation just today about some of these topics. Um, oh, sorry, Mick, Mick and I, go ahead, you go first. Yes, so I, yeah, you first. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say that, and I of course can only speak about taking it necessarily from the academic and back out. So I really look to you all to the experience of <laughs> bringing it back into the academic space. Um, but I think what is so important about the storytelling piece is that we are really thinking about in this work, who is it that we are trying to communicate with, right? Who are the audiences that we're trying to communicate with? We used to really, really be saying, okay, what are the messages that we want to broadcast out, right? We're all kind of speaking with our big, you know, megaphone out, out, out. And I think what is so important is the point that Missy brought up at the end, which is really these stories are just the beginning of a dialogue that builds relationship, right? And so I think this is where hopefully the back and forth happens is in the telling of the story out, but then also hearing the story back as to how that piece of information influenced that community member in whatever way that may be. So that there is this iterative relationship that's building on the science, but it's also building on the relationships that are really at the core of all of the work. Thanks, Jeanette, for going first. Um, so 
one point of clarification, I am not an academic. I did come back to school um, after 10 years of being out of school. And um, when I got the opportunity to be on the curriculum committee, it really, it really allowed me to um, engage with this in a way where we're, yes, we're bringing it back into an academic space, but I almost see it more as a vocational training, which I really, really believe in. Um, and so in the work that I do now, I do work adjacent to academia. I do work with academics, but I'm really um, more on the community engagement side and also trying to take academic spaces and bring them back into a way that is more rooted in indigenous values and the values that I grew up with and working class values and refugee and immigrant values that I feel are really, really powerful. And so um, for me, working with the curriculum community, I did, I did um, work as a TA at OSU. I did work in curriculum development and higher education. So I did get those skills that I'm super grateful for. Um, but I also just wanted to take those and transform them into a more equitable, practical um, application. And so the community dual program is a per uh, the curriculum community is a perfect example of that in a way that you can really get back to your community and figure out how can we take all these big academic sort of resources and ideas and, and transmute them into something that is actually practical and usable for our people and that will um, I have a degree in applied anthropology. So to me, I'm like, this is truly applied work, right? Like taking big concepts and theories um, and applying them in a way that actually creates change um, in the communities that you want to. So yeah, that's my take on the, the academic aspect of what I'm doing with the program. So we have two related questions. I'm gonna pull them together. The first is, as a student, who doesn't live in Oregon, is there something we can do to promote doula programs in our states? And the related question is, um, as a graduating senior at OSU, what are ways that um, I can be involved with a community doula program beyond that time at OSU? So maybe we can move out to that larger focus. Anybody wanna take that one? Well I, I was going to jump in and say that one of the things, um, as Jeanette was talking about sort of living both um, your external, your values, both externally and internally in your organization, one of the things I'm very proud about about this organization is that we are deeply committed to democratizing all of the knowledge and mistakes and everything else that we've made. Um, and so people who are not going to be in our area or who are not in our area currently, but are interested in looking at this. We talk to people a couple times a month, sometimes a couple times a week about starting their own programs, about sharing our data collection information, um, sharing our paperwork packets that we've made up, um, our experience with uh, billing for Medicaid, which is its own special kind of fun. Um, and our experience um, advocating for this, uh, both uh, the work that many people did, many people outside of the CDP did to get the legislation passed in Oregon so that um, Oregon's Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act does pay doulas. Um, and then um, the, to get the program into the hospitals and so forth. So if you are on fire to start something like this in your communities, um, contact us and we will probably just brain dump all over you <laughs> and all sorts of things you didn't even know you wanted to know. Um, but we are really, we're really dedicated to helping um, people work in their own communities to start pro similar programs. And I'll just say in terms of, of students who graduated and want to get involved, you know, if you're still local, we, um, we really love community partners, obviously. You know, we don't see this program as contained within the walls of OSU, you know, even before we were all, you know, virtually connecting with each other. We um, take very seriously the commitment to be out in the community and to see OSU and, and the community as, as not separate entities, but as, as um, 
integrated holes. And so many of the people who participate in our program, we do have a pretty high percentage of our doulas. I think 25% of them have some connection to OSU or have been students before, but that means the vast majority actually don't, you know, so there are many, many ways um, to be involved in our program that, that, you know, don't tie you in any way to OSU. And then, um, you know, considering graduate degrees at OSU is another way that, that people might be able to be involved in the project, because as Mart says, we have so much data. We have, um, numerous uh, projects and uh, papers that are planned. One of them is an oral history of our project. So, so someone has um, collected uh, interview data from all of us and is trying to write the history of the program. And the idea is to have that history written with links that take you to all the things that are mentioned so that it's a it's a sort of a pathway through the program it tells the story of, of like Alicia said all the times we made wrong turns and had to say oh that didn't work let's try something else um, and then we feel really committed to making sure people can click on a link and, and get the materials that we develop so that we're not all siloed reinventing the wheel in each one of our own places right that we can we can be um, collaborating and sharing knowledge um, across the country I'm going to jump in off on that if that's all right. So um, as Missy says, and I said earlier, we do have lots of data, happy to have students come and work on projects, but any of you all, I see we're dropping attendees um, rapidly here. I'm hoping people are headed off to that provost lecture. Um, but any of the rest of you who's still on, who are undergraduates, consider what job you want someday and make sure you need a graduate degree to do that job. Don't just apply to grad school because like you think Missy's awesome or I'm awesome. I mean, we are, but like <laughs> make sure the time and money you put into your graduate study will help you with your long-term career goals because, you know, nobody needs to spend two years or three years doing a master's or five or six years doing a PhD if you don't need that for the job that you want. And I know that probably I'd get in trouble saying that, you know, if like any of our administrators heard me, but um, don't, don't come to grad school unless that's a good choice for you long-term. Yeah, we love community experts and you don't need a grad degree to be a community expert. In fact, it really helps if you don't have that sometimes, so. I will yep. pipe in that I have an undergrad degree in philosophy, right? Which perfectly serves the work that I do. Um, it doesn't have, yeah, you don't always have to have that same alignment. Yeah, but if I can add up till a few months ago, I didn't even have a BA or, you know, undergraduate degree. So yes, and I feel I have been able to contribute with a lot, um, uh, a lot of just my knowledge on the culture, indigenous culture. So yes, you, um, everyone has something to contribute. Not that we don't want grad students, because we do. But. <laughs> so just to kind of pick up on that, other than the thread of OSU, how did you find each other for these collaborations? How, how did we? <laughs> I don't remember that far back. <laughs> there, there must be stories there. <laughs> it's like a lightning strike. It, it just seemed like the perfect confluence of opportunities to come together I want to give you this like idea that we like planned it all, but really it was kind of an accident of history. You know, the, this grant proposal came up and we had an intern who's like, this seems like stuff you do. Should we write this? And we're like, yeah, we'll write it. And we got a grant to do something we'd never done before. And I think out of panic, we just started pulling all these lovely humans together who we, who we adore and have close relationships with. And it, it's a collective it's a collective outcome. It's a, a brainchild that was birthed from all these, these people who had share, I think what we all share in common and what makes us want to work together is this passion for centering the most vulnerable. Like we are all very much guided by the uh, primary tenets of reproductive justice. And when you have something that, that fuels you in that way um, and you take the time um, to build the relationships, I think, um, you know, it speaks to what a group can accomplish when they, they set their mind to it. Thank you. That was possibly maybe um, given that our, we are competing with the provost right now. <laughs> um, 
maybe kind of a beautiful note to, to offer closure on. If anyone out there has any questions you want to post quickly that we could take a look at, do it now. But I think maybe, um, maybe that was kind of our, our, beautiful, our beautiful close there. Thank you so much, Missy and Alicia and Jeanette and Marit and Annaluz and Helen and McNai and Christoph and Ali. Uh, thank you, Aaron, Aaron Sneller and the College of Liberal Arts who has been sort of the wizard behind this webinar in, in terms of holding it all together and bringing us all together. So thanks very much. And um, uh, we wish you a good evening. <laughs>